pastor and being church. Uh, and one of the ways that I've been most excited about is when I am having an opportunity to invite some of our friends uh, from the community who are doing some incredible work uh, to come in and share about the work that they're doing. Uh, hopefully we'll get an understanding of uh, what is really going on in their hearts and lives, some of the things that are going on in our city, uh, ways that perhaps even we as a church uh, can support the organizations uh, that they're a part of and the wonderful work that they are doing. Uh, in particular, I am excited on this night uh, to be able to introduce to you the Reverend Carrie Walker Nettles. Uh, I got to know Carrie as uh, she was working through the Julie Valentine Center. I got to go to one of the luncheons that they have every year a couple of years ago. Uh, got to hear her passion. She gave the invocation and blessing on that particular day. Uh, got to hear her passion, her faith come through uh, for the work that she is doing uh, as a victim's service specialist at the Julie Valentine Center. Uh, if you've not had a chance to go to that luncheon, they just had it this past, what was it, on Valentine's Day, wasn't it? Yes, last Thursday. Um, it is one of the most excruciating, uh, eye-opening, and powerful events you can go to all year long. Uh, it would benefit all of us to be able to hear uh, about the important inf information that they share uh, and uh, the important work that they do. So I'm excited uh, that Carrie is here to share with us tonight. Um, so Carrie Nettles, as I've already said, is the Victim Service Specialist at the Julie Valentine Center here in Greenville. Uh, the Julie Valentine Center is a nonprofit organization that provides free confidential services to sexual assault and child abuse survivors and their families. Uh, they are one of 14 rape crisis centers here in South Carolina. Uh, they also educate the community on how to identify, respond to, and prevent sexual violence and child abuse. Their mission statement and philosophy provide a framework for all of their services that they provide. Uh, they adopt, uh, advocate excuse me, for and support survivors of sexual assault and child abuse. They ensure that survivors are respected, valued, and their voices are heard. And some of their core values include trust, compassion, empowerment, accountability, and inclusion. Uh, and their mission is to stop sexual violence and child abuse and the impact of these crimes through prevention, investigation, collaboration, treatment, and advocacy. Reverend Carrie Nettles earned a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Clemson University and a Master of Divinity from Luther, Lutheran Theological Seminary. Uh, Carrie has worked with the children's ministries of five different churches and as a child advocate with the D. Norton Child Advocacy Center in Charleston. Uh, Carrie has traveled to General Theological Seminary to study with Jerome Berryman, uh, specifically working on a theology of the child and the spirituality, spirituality excuse me, of the child. In 2015, Carrie returned to the upstate to complete a residency with the spiritual care department in Greenville Memorial Hospital where she worked across all units, encountering various stages of trauma and recovery, specifically assigned to the Pediatric Psychiatric Facility and Children's Hospital. Uh, Carrie is a candidate for endorsement at the Alliance of Baptists and has entered the board certification process. Uh, she's a member of the Association of Professional Chaplains and the Pediatric Chaplains Network. In January of 2017, Carrie became the first staff chaplain in the nation serving a child advocacy center. Uh, and together, she and her spouse, Mason, parent two children, Brett and Bridget, and they herd a bunch of sheep, which I don't know if we'll get into that tonight, but I definitely want to hear more about that. Uh, Carrie joins us tonight to share uh, her experience and the power of offering blessing to children in a way that bears witness to the love of God through Christ for all people and that seeks to counteract the other narratives so prevalent uh, in our culture. Carrie, we welcome you. You are among friends. We are blessed to hear from you. Let's welcome Carrie Nettles tonight. I am so glad to be here with you tonight and um, to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about, which is um, advocating for children, recognizing and supporting the spirituality of the child. Um, so to start off with, I'm going to give you a little context for not just the work that I do, but also the world that our children are living in now. It's different than the world you grew up in. It's different than the world I grew up in. And it's changing rapidly. Um, and that has benefits um, and it has unintended consequences. So I'm going to paint uh, something of a bleak picture at first. Uh, but then we're going to talk about what you can do uh, for the lives of the children in, in your life, in your church, in your family, in your neighborhood. Okay? 
So um, I'm going to tell you I'm starting off with this premise. Uh, My theology of the child is based largely on Christ's posture to the child. Um, So I believe that children are loved and welcomed by God, by Christ, and, and that we are to not do anything to inhibit their spiritual growth and formation, right, but only nurture it. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. So here's the agenda I just laid out for you. So we're going to talk about the world they're living in now, some competing narratives that are trying to tell them who they are and what they're about, right, versus what our narrative is for them as the church. Uh, I'm going to talk about what resilience looks like and the role that you have in helping to build that resilience, okay? So uh, the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics estimates that the average child is exposed to 13,000 television ads a year. Now that's just television ads. That's not counting the YouTube ads that pop up, the social media apps that pop up, the billboards on the side of the road, the magazine ads in the magazines in their waiting rooms. They are exposed to advertisements and narratives constantly, okay? In the world they live in, one in four girls will be sexually assaulted before she's 18 years old. One in six boys will be sexually assaulted before he's 18 years old. We also suspect that that number is a little low, that it may actually be more than that, but that's what we have uh, disclosed to us. And the average age a child first accidentally stumbles upon internet pornography is age eight. This is not the magazines that were tucked away in the bottoms of drawers when any of us were growing up. This is harsh content. This is very explicit graphic content on the internet. And they can easily stumble upon it without trying to find it. So of the children who do experience sexual assault, we know that stranger danger is a myth. 93% of victims know their assailant. 59% are acquaintances, 34% are family members, only 7% fall into that stranger category. So we have this research now called Adverse Childhood Experiences. That is a list of one of 10 potential experiences that any of us could have had 67% of us have had at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. Um, That includes physical or emotional neglect, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, or these major household challenges, which include uh, witnessing domestic abuse, having someone in the family who is a substance abuser, a mental illness in the family, a parental separation or divorce, and or the incarceration of a parent. So if you have had any of those experiences, your ACE score, your adverse childhood experiences score on a range of zero to 10 um, is, is what your ACE score is. Now, what does that mean? That has a lot of physical uh, implications for our long-term health care. We can, uh, you know, four and a half times more likely to develop depression if you have uh, four or more ACEs. You have a three times more likely to develop uh, lung disease. Uh, you're 11 times more likely to participate in intravenous drug use. Some of these are behavioral issues and some of them are the way the body changes when we internalize trauma. And the thing that I want to leave you with too is that children with a, a score of four or more are 12 times more likely uh, to attempt suicide than their peers. So the other thing I want to lift up to you is the fact that children have theological questions too. This is one of the reasons that I have this job because I started asking myself as a former children's minister who is speaking to the theodicy needs in this child's life, the children who pass through the CAC, right? And even if a child doesn't know the word theodicy or can't articulate it, they are still wrestling with some of these questions. And these are some direct quotes from some of my clients. Things like, Where is God and does he care? Um, What did I do to deserve this? Where is God in all of this? Uh, These are questions all of us probably ask at some point in time in our lives, and they're no less 
pertinent to the child who has a zero ACE score to a child that has four, six, or higher ACE score, okay? So, I want you to know about the spirituality of the child. Just like adults, they are all of us, whether we're a Christian or not Christian, we are all dealing with relational consciousness and existential limits. So this is um, an attempt to depict in graphic form what uh, Rebecca Nye, who has written uh, several books on the spirituality of the child, describes. So you have, you have the relational consciousness of we're self-relating individuals, and at the same time we are always relating to others, to that which is transcendent, we in this room call it God, um, and creation or nature, right? So sometimes you feel better when you go to the beach, when you go to the mountains, when you go sit by the river, right? At the same time that all of that relating is going on, we're all bumping up against these existential limits. The existential limits um, that we hit in relationship to community is our aloneness, um, our existential limit up against ourselves is what are the limits of our freedom. Our existential limit uh, in relationship to creation and nature is our finitude, death. And our, our existential limit in relationship to God, our higher power, or that which is transcendent, is our way of making meaning, right? So for those of us who are raised with Bible stories, one of the reasons our Sunday school teachers and our grandmothers and our parents and our pastors taught us those Bible stories are so that we can continue to carry them in our tool belt as different life events happen, as a trauma occurs, a death of a loved one, a car accident, maybe a sexual assault. If there's any sort of major life change or trauma in our life, we are asking some version of where is God in all of this? What does this mean for me now? And sometimes we're using those stories. Maybe we call on the story of Job uh, to make sense of our suffering. So children are no different, right? They are experiencing all of those even if they can't articulate those words. So when we're talking about the spirituality of the child or anybody, we're talking about having connection, having values, purpose, belonging, identity, and meaning-making. And you may be able to see some of those from that depiction of the way that we are always relating to these elements in our life and bumping up against these existential limits. These are some of the themes that we're dealing with. When I'm offering spiritual care to our clients at Julie Valentine Center, we're dealing with themes like love and belonging, forgiveness, trust, intimacy, because you know that's been broken oftentimes if they're coming to see us hope, gratitude, meaning, identity, and peace. So when I'm working with our clients, one of the things that I'm trying to determine is who or what is telling you who you are. Now ideally, when the church is being the church, we're showing up in the world and we're telling everyone, our members inside included, that you are a child of God that you are loved beyond measure, that you are loved so much that even Christ defeated death to love you this much, right? <clears throat> but I told you earlier, that's not the only narrative that's showing up in their life, right? We have all of these ads that are trying to sell them something. We have and ads are not necessarily bad. Some of us work in marketing. Some of us work in, um, in these different capitalist industries. But I, what I want to make you aware of is that whether they're watching a television show on TV or Netflix or YouTube, they're relating with their peers at school, on swim team, lacrosse team, youth group, wherever they're showing up and interacting with the world in all those ways, um, they are being fed messages, messages about who they should be, what they should be, what they should wear, how they should act, right? And you may remember in your own lives feeling like, oh, I really should wear clothing with this label on it, right? Or I really should wear shoes that look like this. Or I really should 
fall in with this group rather than this group. Um, and something in your life is helping you tell yourself that story, right? And part of the way you tell that story to yourself and receive the messages from those around you um, is helping you determine what your identity is, right? Now, at best, I used to say this all the time as a children's minister, at best, if we can get church members with their children, grandchildren, whomever, in the door, every time the doors are open, that's what, maximum four hours a week, if we count Sunday morning and Wednesday night? That's a drop in the bucket compared to the narratives of the school friends, the teachers, the coaches, the neighborhood kids, the media ads, the media narratives. So some of the narratives I've heard from my children and adult clients, this is where they got to. And sometimes this was the result of an explicit message that was given to them by someone who was supposed to be a caregiver um, and or this was the implicit message that they made meaning with um, after a series of events. I had a 10-year-old tell me I'm going to bad heaven. I have a 14-year-old who tells me I'm a bad kid. Um, I have a 44-year-old who believes she was not worth God's protection. And once upon a time, I had a 13-year-old who was told she was a reprobate who was abhorrent to God. And I can't tell you to what extent she internalized that and made that narrative her own and continued to reify that in her own self-relating but that was one of the messages given to her. And I want you to know that that which is perceived to be real is real in its consequences. So you may believe that every child in your church, every child in your youth group or member of this larger church family of yours, every child in your biological family or your neighborhood, you may sincerely, deeply believe that they are precious and loved and worthy of love, and that there is no thing that can separate them from God's extravagant love. But if these other narratives are competing at the rate in which they're being given to the children, that narrative that's perceived to be real by the child is real in its consequences. Does that make sense? Ooh. So what does resilience look like? Resilience is the way that the secular world talks about it, the way the child maltreatment world, the social work world talks about building resilience in kids, particularly children who've experienced adverse childhood experiences. But what we know as the church, we've been offering resilience for a long time. What can we do? I want you to be a trusted adult in the lives of the children in your church. I want you to learn their names and learn what their interests are, what their hobbies are. So when you see them, you can say, hey, Matt, how was the basketball game? Hey, Sue, how was the math test last week? So you can start building, if you haven't already, some of those relationships. Be able to call them by a name, engage them in conversation, be a consistent presence in their lives. And I'm a little bit talking to the parents in the room, but I'm mostly talking to you in relationship to the children for whom you are not the caregiver, right? I want you to be a trusted adult in their life in addition to their primary caregivers. In fact, well, I'll get to this in a minute, but this being consistent and building these connections with them, the silver bullet is relationships. And so you know, that, I mean, this is why God created us, right? To be in relationship with God and with one another. And that's the silver bullet for a child who is just going through normal, healthy, typical teenage development drama, in addition to a child that's dealing with adverse childhood experiences or recent sexual assault, uh, experience in the juvenile justice system, whatever trauma might be showing up in their life. Relate to them like they're people, just like you. And whether they're four or 14, you can ask them, what did you think about that? They have really 
fascinating answers, by the way. I wanted you to know that four-year-olds are my favorite theologians. So whether you're talking about the, the Sunday school lesson or whether you're riding in the car and you're you know, noticing a particular billboard ad, what do you think that is trying to say? So if you're inviting them into some sort of critical thinking or philosophical thinking or theological thinking, ha invite the conversation, have the conversation, and they may go off on wild tangents that you can't follow, but the importance is just you're inviting them to be in conversation and remaining in conversation with them, right? That's the connection that you're building. So there was an incident, my, my 44-year-old that I was telling you about who sat on the couch in front of me and sobbed and asked me, why wasn't I worth God's protection? You see, her stepfather had sexually assaulted her from the age of four or five to her early teens when she was able to finally run away and escape. And he was a leader in the church. He was someone that people in the church looked to as a um, faithful, devoted church member, always there helping and leading. And she saw that. She saw the way that he was revered by his fellow church and the people in the community, and she knew what she was experiencing at his hands at home. So it's a valid question when she looks at me sobbing and says, why wasn't I worth God's protection? It's a good question. I can only honor that question and say, thank you for sharing that with me. But that moment changed the way that I do Sunday school. I'm a fifth grade Sunday school teacher now, um, and I enjoy doing that. I, we use godly play curriculum, which is... Uh, Something that I use in my clinical practice as well, something that I, you heard that I went and studied with Jerome Berryman, who created it um, to intentionally develop a theology of the child. So I used to think the most important thing I could do as a Sunday school teacher was not to leave them with like a takeaway word, like, and always remember to be faithful. Like, when you talk about the development of the child, that's not attached to anything. That's just this um, amorphous concept that is floating around, and it doesn't have a lot of meaning for them. So for the longest time in ministering to children, particularly in the setting of the church, I was convinced that the most important thing that I could do was equip them with the stories. Because like we said before, we can put those stories in our tool belt, and use them for the rest of our lives to help make meaning of what we're experiencing. And my work at the Julie Valentine Center with survivors, child and adult survivors in general, in this moment with this woman in particular, forever changed my Sunday school practice. So that now, if they leave and they don't remember a thing of the story that I shared, it's okay. What I want them to have experienced from me or one of the other Sunday school teachers is a blessing, a very deliberate, intentional blessing. I invite them to blessing. I don't force it on them. That's me modeling good, healthy boundaries and consent, which is something else you can do too as a trusted adult in their lives. And then I say something to them about who they are in relationship to God and who God is. And I make sure that every time they leave Sunday school, at best I get them, what, 40 minutes a week? And that's if they're coming every week. So the most important thing for me is they know that I am one more adult in their life who is speaking love and words of belonging and words of worth into their lives, if that makes any sense. So when I talk about being one of the trusted adults, we talk with adults who want to be caregivers of children, protective, supportive people in their lives, and we talk to children about, we want you to have five trusted adults in addition to your primary caregivers. So for my children, for example, besides my husband and myself, I want them to have at least five. And we say five because you can use this little illustration of holding up, right? So this is the support network that helps them through the difficult times, the typical teenage development times, the times of trauma and adverse childhood experiences. If they have something that they need to talk about, that they want to protect mom from, 
be the auntie or uncle in their life that they can bring this to and talk about with unconditional love, belief, acceptance, and support, right? So whether you're a teacher or an auntie or uncle or just fictive kin in their church family, this is one of the things that you can do to help build resilience in the lives of children. So whether you're offering an official blessing on the child, like you are a beloved child, there is nothing that you can do to separate yourself from God's love. And I'm I'm aware that the children here during communion can come up and receive a blessing from your pastors. So whether you're doing something official like that, or whether you're passing in the halls of the church and you say, hey Mike, good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. That has an effect of blessing because you are a member of their church family, right? Another example of a, of a blessing, because of this work, I got into the habit when my daughter was born of tucking her in and, and part of our routine at night, you know, pajamas, brush your teeth, read the books, tuck in the stuffed animals too. And the very last thing I do, I make the sign of the cross on her forehead and I say to her, Bridget, you are a beloved child of God. And that's become part of the language of our family. Um, Sometimes I'll add something to it like, there's nothing you can do to lose God's love or my love. But it's become such a part of her narrative in addition to LOL dolls and Lego friends and Barbie and all of that, it's become such a part of her narrative that now our precious boxer, Rango, has probably the most blessed canine in the world because he frequently gets the sign of the cross on his forehead and gets told, you are a beloved dog of God. My hope is that all children have more than enough believing, supporting, protective caregivers in their lives, trusted adults that they know will be part of their support network, come what may, that there's nothing they can do to lose your love. And I just included this. Mama Bear Effect is a really nice Instagram and Facebook to follow if you want to see more messages like this. But I believe that a child who is treated with dignity and respect in their childhood won't spend the entirety of their adulthood learning that they're worth it because God said so. So that's my vision for the future. Let all the children have more than enough supportive, protective caregivers, trusted adults in their lives. Thank you for letting me come. Um, thank you for sharing your heart, um, for uh, shedding light on the context that uh, we often would prefer to ignore because it is quite scary. Uh, and so I'm grateful for that. I'm extremely grateful for your understanding of blessing and the power of it and the, the way that that can uh, sort of reshape uh, our sense of identity through our narrative. Um, I was a communi- communication major in college, and so I had zone in on the fact that we are uh, storytelling people, and the stories that we tell and the stories uh, that we learn really do help us make meaning, not just about the world, but even more than that, about ourselves. Uh, and so I, I want to get to know you a little bit more. I want our congregation to get to know you a little bit more as well. Uh, and so when you ask that, uh, that question sort of at the top, where who is, who is who has told you about yourself, and then kind of by extension, what are the stories that they are telling you? So if you don't mind, shed a little light on your own experience of the church. Uh, What stories did the church tell you uh, about who you are? And how have those stories served you well? And then where might the church have done a little bit more uh, to to help tell you a little bit more of a good holistic story about yourself uh, that would help last through time? Great. Um... I'm really 
really fortunate in the scheme of, of things. Um, and none of us, regardless of, of race, socioeconomic class, level of education, none of us are immune to the effects of childhood adversity and the adversity that shows up in our lives. So for all intents and purposes, you know, from the outside, my life looked very much like standard beaver cleaver kind of life, right? Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, that I was shielded from ACEs. I have a couple in my life. Um, like you saw, 67% of us do have at least one. Um, but I offer that context because there was no, um, no significant event or great tragedy uh, that happened in my life. I had two parents uh, in the household growing up. I had uh, grandparents. I had four grandparents. In fact, when I was born, I had four great-grandparents mm. alive. Um, and, you know, going um, the early stages of my life, we lived kind of far away. But then um, when we moved closer into extended family, we kind of got into the routine of having uh, Sunday lunch after church with extended family. Um, so I benefited from having uh, this this extended family in my life who are helping tell the stories. There are a lot of stories you probably have a similar experience. If you, if you grew up with other family in your life, you might be able to tell stories about your family from before you were born because you've sat around with your family members and heard them retell those stories enough. Mm -hmm. I can tell you some stories about my family that predate my existence, mm -hmm. but I have heard them shared enough times to remember them. Um, and that was actually a model that I always used for the way that we show up and do ministry with children is, you know, help them know the stories of God and God's people, at least as well as they know the story of Cars or Frozen or <laughs> Spider-Man, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> so these were the folks in my life. And, and I always had um, my first home, and then we moved here. I grew up at First Baptist um, from late elementary school on through young adulthood. And I had really great Sunday school teachers, great uh, youth minister, and, and those people remained mm -hmm. uh, some of these for me yeah. throughout college, throughout young adulthood. Um, the, you know, the woes of, of uh, financial crisis hitting, mm -hmm. Uh, first marriage did not last. Uh, a lot of uh, reassessing and trying to figure out what to do with life. These people mm -hmm. have remained. And uh, my mom uh, died of metastatic breast cancer just a three, almost three years ago. And um, the same people who taught me Sunday school and um, chaperoned my youth mm -hmm. trips mm -hmm and grew up with me as a, a same age peer doing those things. Um, we're also, you know, bringing in the food and helping find a place for the plants for mom's funeral. They were there mm. through all of that. And now, you know, some of them are teaching my children. Yeah. Um, so they were story bearers uh, for me, with me, through yeah. all of it. Yeah. I'm not, honestly, you know, my, none of my childhood church, my my small childhood church and then First Baptist, I don't know that there's anything they could have done better. Good. They're not perfect. <laughs> They're not perfect. Not um, uh, but I, I had really great people yeah. in my life. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm really interested in because because you grew up in a church background. I grew up in a church background. But as we've said before, uh, at best, you get some of these kids 40 minutes a week, maybe for Sunday school, uh, four hours a week if they're there every time the door is open. But let's right. be honest, that's not the reality these no. days. Uh, our church benefits from the fact that we do have a, a very large after school and preschool ministry that um, really we've got uh, close to 90 children in our preschool that oh, are wow. there. Uh, some of them we're here, are here more than they are even with their own parents. And then our after school that turns into a summer camp is over 100. And they go, so we're talking close to 200 children that are on our campus Monday through Friday and then even more as well when you include our congregation. But then if you look at our, the numbers you mentioned, one in four girls, girls 
uh, have been abused. One in six boys, and as we said, that, that number's probably low because we, uh, I, I imagine that the males are less likely to report than others. But you're talking a good 50 of the children who are on our campus could very easily be suffering from some of the trauma that you, you've mentioned, which is a scary thing for us to think of, but it also reminds us of the need to be that good witness-bearing group yes. for them that helps them to see that there is a different story that God wants to tell about their lives. Um, but let's move it outside of that realm now because we've got an opportunity to interact with them. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading in sort of the missional theology of things right now, the church going beyond the walls, the church that is constantly sent out to bear witness into the world, sort of that uh, Acts 1-8, that you're yes. going to be my witnesses is what Jesus told his disciples before he ascended, uh, ascended into heaven. Um, and I think that's crucial right now because people are not coming into the church. And sometimes it's because of the trauma that has been experienced inside the walls of the church. Yes. So talk for me, uh, for, if you can, how do we go beyond our walls and bear prophetic witness out there as we know we're called to do? How do we go out there and we say, this is the story that God wants to tell about all people, that you are a beloved child of God uh, because we have to go out there and say it when they're not coming in here. What, what can that look like for us, uh, particularly for children? Mm. I think that's a great question. There's, a, there's an after-school thing that happens sponsored by, a, I don't know if it's a church or a parachurch organization. I won't name it, um, but it's an option where my daughter goes to school mm -hmm. after school. I won't let her go to that because I don't trust the the message imparted to her will be actual good news. Mm. Um, so I think it gets tricky, right? And, mm -hmm. and you said yourself, there's there's been some significant harm that people have experienced, sometimes directly. I don't know if you've been paying attention to local and national news mm -hmm. lately, but the church hasn't always gotten our witness right. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the witness of the church has been not believing mm. people when they disclose and kind of covering it up and just like rotating pastors around so mm. they can go have uh, a different place to serve, but then also consequently a different group of kids to pray on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are a lot of folks that I encounter who say, you know, I left the church and I'm never going back. And I, honestly, I can't say I blame them. Hmm. And at the same time, I do deeply believe in the church as an outpost of heaven. Hmm. That when the church is being the church, we are pointing to that more excellent way. Hmm. And we are, point, we are indexing the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. Hmm. I, I, so I have this deep love um, for the church, but also these like, really high expectations. Like, <laughs> don't get it wrong because mm. I've seen too many people hurt. Um, and so that, like that mm. high expectation thing, that's on me. I have to wrestle with that. <laughs> um, but I would say, so here's, here's what I tell parents. When we have parents come in whose children have been sexually assaulted. Um, I, you can probably imagine that they're upset and they're trying to figure out how to uh, grapple with this new reality and they want to do and say everything perfect right and oftentimes now not every parent shows up in a protective way or a believing way but for those parents who who do and who are sincerely trying to figure out how best to love their child and parent after something like this I tell them and sometimes many many times because sometimes it takes a while for it to like sink in and for us to believe it right I tell them the very best gift that you can give your child, you've already done because they told you and you believed them and then you acted in a protective capacity, right? So you got whoever it was out of the house or you got them away from that person, whatever needed to happen, you believed them and then you acted to protect. And I would say that's a pretty good illustration for what the church can do. Mm. Sometimes those of us who don't work inside the field have 
questions or trouble understanding how a biological father could perpetrate these acts on his own daughter mm. or you know or why would the teenager say that because you know teenagers are already struggling and I'm just having a hard time believing but I I stand firm on the best gift we can give children and adult survivors particularly children because there are so many barriers already to a child disclosing what has happened to them is for the church to embody that believing, listening, protective attitude and posture, if that makes any sense. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I know that we're, we're focusing primarily on children because we, we want to set a good foundation, but the reality of it is that there are, uh, as, as we've said, when we're preaching about some of these things, we're preaching to a congregation, many of whom may have experienced them uh, as children, but they're now still dealing with them as adults. You spoke Absolutely. of a, a, a 42, 44 year old uh, who was dealing with these things. So we've got these, these uh, adverse childhood experiences, right? So is there any uh, study being done on what it takes to sort of not move beyond them necessarily, but rewrite the story? Yes. If we're talking about the narrative. So, so what does it take for us as a church to be able to help people in our congregation who are dealing with these things now? Yes. Even as adults, it impacted them as children. What does it take for us to, to help them sort of understand a new sense of their story and identity? So the good news of the ACE research is it is never too late to benefit from trauma intervention, right? So I may, and I have had 80-year-olds come into our office and tell us what happened when she was a child, for the first time in her life, we are literally the first people in the world she has breathed this to. That doesn't change the 80 years of life she's lived up until that point, but she can still benefit. It's never too late for trauma intervention. What does that look like? Well, there are trauma-informed um, school movements, and that is helping um, teachers, janitors, principals, everybody on site parent, room, mm -hmm. parent people uh, better understand that the bad behaviors that you see are usually rooted in something. So there's like a little workbook for kids. It's called, I'm not bad, I'm sad or mad. Mm. Okay, well, get curious. What's beneath that? Mm. What good reason do you have to be sad or mad? Mm. Um, so there's a way in which I think we can translate that to our adult interactions too. Um, to get curious about why people show up in the world the way they do, why they behave the way they do. Get curious about what is the story he or she is telling herself and what might be a good news story mm. that you can point to as an alternative narrative, mm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is the things that have happened to you don't have to be the primary thing that defines you. Mm. So to have people in your life who are believing and supportive can also be the people who help empower you to take back the narrative and decide how the rest of the story is going to be written, right? Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So generally when we're training advocates at the Julie Valentine Center, we tell them, you know, don't, don't push your agenda on the survivor. If you're there in the ER with someone and they want to get medical help, but they don't want an investigation, like, even if it's like within the window, so you're thinking, oh, we have the potential to get really good evidence that can turn into an investigation. Like, that's, that's our agenda. Mm. That's not this person's, mm. right? So mm. honoring the choices that they make for themselves that are right for them, mm. um, that's good. And so I would say generally the church being, you know, the individual relationships that you have with people as well as the body of Christ relationship to a person, um, just blessing and honoring the choices that they need to make um, reserving judgment, offering unconditional love to the best that you can because that's the call, mm. right? 
That, am I answering? Yeah, that no, that, I, that's, that's beautiful. And, I, and I'm, I'm absolutely appreciate it. So I, I, I want to know a little bit about, if you can share with us, what an experience is like for someone who comes to the Julie Valentine Center. Uh, just as far as just a, a very quick, what is the safe environment that they're, that they're in? How, does that, uh, how do you take them through some, some things? Because I, I think our people uh, need to understand some of that. So uh, there's, there's three framed quotes in our lobby. And when you walk in, the, those are hanging on the wall for you to see. And that may help uh, folks who are coming in to receive services um, get an insight into kind of where are we starting from? What, what, what posture are we assuming from the get-go, right? And, um, and they're different kind of inspirational quotes, but they're, they're directed specifically to the confluence of life events that are clients have experienced. One of them is um, the ax forgets, but the tree remembers. Mm. It's a proverb from somewhere, some culture in the world, I can't remember. Um, so we have heard from clients that oftentimes it, it takes a lot of time and building up courage for them to get themselves to to our facility and through our door. We've had a lot of clients say, you know, I really, um, I really was considering suicide. And, you know, and if I hadn't finally gotten to you, I think I'm, I might have continued to pursue that. Mm. Um, but by and large, what we hear from our clients is that when they came, they felt safe. Because we show up and we don't question anybody's story. Um, we've made a commitment to believe everybody who comes through our doors, right? Um, now, DSS, law enforcement, solicitor's office, these are uh, community partners of ours who we have to work together to do the work that we do. Um, but they have different commitments uh, to different entities. Uh, so. Our clients may not have that experience of everyone they encounter, but our posture is that's how healing starts, is for them to experience us uh, listening to them and believing them. And so then our advocacy there on out is, is rooted in that. Um, and, and it's affirming their choices. So some of them want to go through therapy. We offer therapy for free. We don't want there to be any barriers to people experiencing the, the healing that they need. Um, we offer support groups for loved ones. We offer support groups for male survivors. We offer support groups for female survivors. Um, we have a spirituality group. Um, people can come and get spiritual care services. Sometimes they've had clergy people in their life or church leaders in their life who have not signaled to them that it would be safe or okay to say something like, I'm angry mm. at God, mm. or I don't even know if I believe God exists anymore. Mm. Uh, but they have that safe space with me uh, mm. because I'm not that to them. I'm not that person in their life that they believe is going to um, judge them or withhold communion from them or, or kick them out of the church or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some, some of our survivors have become kind of extended family to us. That, um, over the years, they've gone through services and um, they reached a point in their life where they're feeling um, empowered. And one of the ways they want to give back is to volunteer with us. So now they're going with us um, as part of the team to respond to ER calls or answering the hotline or whatnot. And um, and so they're, you know, their family in the office, they come in. Hey, Sue, how you doing? <laughs> hey, good to see you. Yeah. Um, so, and that's generally, now everybody has like the similarities, but everybody's like part of the journey is, is very individualized, but. Yeah. yeah. So how can we support Julie Valentine's Day? Oh, wow. Well, you can always uh, give financial right. gifts. Right, yeah, I figured that was gonna be in there somewhere, good. Um, because we are a nonprofit, we are funded partially through grants and the rest of that is through um, 
philanthropical endeavors and fundraising and, and uh, gifts from the community. Mm -hmm. um, we have sort of an ongoing wish list on our website where you can see um, kind of general needs that are perennial needs. Mm. Um, at Christmas time, you can adopt children if you wanted to. Um, adopt a, a set of siblings if you need. Uh, so we offer uh, Christmas to all of the families who have come through our center in the given year who also have need of that assistance, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not across the board everybody that we've seen that year. Um, you can come and do projects. Some of you came a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. and helped us uh, kind of reorganize our warehouse. Um, and that was I want you to know, jaws dropped. They were really so <laughs> impressed um, with the work you were able to knock out in just like an hour or two. Mm -hmm. um, if if you felt so called, you know, you might want to come and volunteer with us sometimes. Maybe that's like helping man a table at our race or at our luncheon, but maybe that's going through our victim service provider training mm. and helping respond to ER calls um, or answering the hotline. Um, but you know, you can also, you can pray for us mm. and you can pray for our clients and you can pray for uh, the messages and the stories mm. that they've been told and the stories that they're telling themselves. And you can pray about the more excellent way mm. that some way, somehow, someone intersects in their lives and shows up in a way that witnesses to that more excellent way. Mm -hmm. and I think you do that in a powerful way. I mean, so much of what you do is just simply what we would call the ministry of presence, of, of showing up, of being there, of, of believing. And, and as we're, we close, I, I'm, I'm struck by uh, what you said about the uh, perception becomes the reality and the consequences. Uh, we talked a little bit beforehand about uh, Tom Long's sermon, the God you see is the God you get. And yes. so if you have this sense of, uh, a vindictive, uh, hateful uh, God that, that brings wrath down upon people who are quote-unquote bad, right. um, that's what you see in God, and then that's what you see in yourself. And, and I think we would both admit, while we understand that there are churches out there who present that image, that's not the image of God that we have come to truly understand. So, so in conclusion, as you show up in these experiences, what is the God that you hope they get through that experience? I have only one sermon in me. And if you invited me to come back and preach multiple times, you'd get different sermons. But the core of it is just simply this. And it is uh, the model on which I base all of my ministry and my hope for every single uh, younger or older child of God is that they know and believe that they are precious, beloved children of God. And there is no thing, neither heights nor depths, nor powers, nor things present or things to come, nor anything else in all creation can separate you from that love. Precious, beloved child of God, nothing, no thing can separate you from that love. That's the God that I've come to have a relationship with, that I believe in, that I profess, and the God that I hope everyone comes to experience. Jerry, thank you for your time, for sharing your heart with us, for your ministry. You will be in our prayers. Thank and you. And we look forward to crossing paths again and coming to be with you over at the Julie Valentine Center, hopefully soon again. Uh, to share and work and volunteer. Let's thank Carrie Nettles for being with us tonight and for all that she does. Thank you. Thank you.